What's up everyone? Welcome back. My name's David and uh today we're going to talk about uh how I fell into homelessness for the first time. So let's get into it. So, let's see. The year would have been 1999. 1999, right before 2000 I believe it was and um, actually you know what uh, let's 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 really go back into the memory bank here I gotta really think because I was uh, about 17 years old and my grandmother who raised me from the time I was two years old was diagnosed with Alzheimer's she had a stroke and a lot of her memory just went away from her. And at the time, it was just me and her. And uh, we had a family business going that her and my grandfather started. And uh, I was uh, involved in since I was probably about five years old. And I remember her telling me too, she came back from a doctor's appointment, she said, David, don't worry, everything will be set up, you'll be fine. And uh, although momentarily it was okay, um, I was actually already renting my own house at 17 years old. I had already completed my GED and was working full time for the family business. I was renting this little uh, one bedroom loft uh, with a detached garage for $500 a month and um, it was okay for the moment um, but nothing was in paper nothing was in writing so nothing was protected and later on when she was deemed to be basically incompetent a uh, power of attorney was signed over to a family member and we sort of had a falling out because I got upset that um, they brought somebody else into the business as well. And that business wasn't meant for them. It was meant for me. Um, but I'm not here to dwell on that. That's just, uh, this is just the beginning of how I fell into uh, my first stint of homelessness at the age of 17. So like I said, uh, I was renting a place out. And uh, when I got the door shut on me on the family business, um, I lost that place. And I, I really didn't know what to do at that moment in time in my life. I was too young, didn't understand what was going on. And so everything started falling apart really fast. And I'm trying to really dig in the memory banks here because a lot of this stuff I've let go over the years, have tried not to think about. Um, cause it was a very sad moment in my life, uh, losing my grandmother, you know, uh, my grandfather had passed when I was 12. So about five years previous and, uh, both of my grandfathers actually passed within three months of each other. So I lost both of my grandfathers, the only men that ever raised me in my life, uh, within three months of each other. So that was a tough thing to deal with as well. Went through a lot of different things, uh, struggled with rebellion and, drugs and all kinds of different things uh, but to get back to the story um, you know I didn't really know what to do when my grandmother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and the family doors shut on me at the business uh, so I started to, to kind of fall apart myself I, I didn't even know what to do for work anymore um, I defaulted on my rent uh, and was asked to to leave before I was served an eviction and so I did um, I actually started living in my car and that lasted for a couple of years um, I worked for a couple of different companies um, and it took me a while to get back to work honestly <clears throat> the first job I took away from the family business was at uh, Robinson's May in Riverside, California. I worked in uh, housewares and luggage. And I remember all my life I had done 
repair type work. And so, uh, this was all new to me, retail, you know. And so, my grandmother was put into an Alzheimer's home where she would have uh, more closer attention. And uh, I would go visit her, you know, once in a while. But it was difficult because uh, she wouldn't remember who I was sometimes. Oftentimes, she would think I was my father. And so, that was awkward, too, because my dad was, you know, deceased since I was uh, six years old. And so eventually I realized that uh, life had to kind of go on regardless of what was going on around me. And uh, there was a time where I was contacted and told uh, that my grandma wasn't doing very well, uh, but I was scheduled to work that day. And uh, I called my manager and told him that uh, I needed the day off. And... Um, you know, they were kind of slow to give me the day off, but, you know, they eventually said okay. And so I went to see her, and her health was definitely declining. And, uh, yeah, so I was a little bit lost on my feelings, didn't really know how to act, didn't really know what to do. Um, so, yeah, the following day... Um, I called out again, and because I was within a 90-day probation period, they uh, terminated me. And so here I am again, you know, right before my 18th birthday, um, living in my car, you know, in front of a friend's house, and uh, not knowing what to do, I was like pretty much on the verge of giving up you know, hope of anything. I just, I remember contemplating suicide and those thoughts were rampant through my mind a lot. Just like, I just, I'm going to end it all, you know, that was, that was the way I was going to deal with it. So that way I didn't have to feel the pain anymore. Um, but with failed attempt after failed attempt, uh, I think I realized that I wasn't meant to commit suicide. So not to dwell on that too much. Um, after being uh, terminated from Robinson's May, um, I continued to live out of my car in front of my friend's house. And just kind of lived day to day. Um, I remember for a long period of time, I was surviving off of uh, whatever my... My friend's grandparents would give me uh, to eat, which most of the time was either a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, or once in a while they would uh, invite me in for a dinner. But uh, where I was parked, there was, I remember, a plum tree. So I remember eating a lot of plums uh, during, it was a, I think it was a summertime too. And uh, we had a bit of uh, some weather that year in Riverside. And I remember actually being able to just kind of forget about what everything was going on around me, you know. I would just lay back in my chair in the car and listen to the rain pelt off the roof. And that was relaxing to me. Uh, but then, you know, the next day would come along like, oh, here we go again, another day. What do we do? Uh, and eventually I kind of snapped out of it and was like, you know, i got to find another job. I need money. Um, I don't know how I'm going to survive. <clears throat> so I uh, was in the classified papers and there was a job opportunity at a local dealership I think it was for a lot porter and so I went down and interviewed and got the job uh, so I, I worked for this company for a couple months um, but then much similar to the first job that I took I, I got another call uh, telling me that my grandma wasn't doing so well again that I should probably come see her so I did, and of course, uh, you know, it was during scheduled work hours, uh, so I had to call off, and, um, you know, I was just like, here we go again, you know, like, and what am I going to do, like, 
not go see my grandma. This might be the last time I see her. I owed it to the woman. And uh, I did it again the following day. I got terminated from that job. And there's some foggy moments in there in between. Um, but basically from moving around a little bit because I couldn't just stay in one spot with my vehicle. Um, actually, there was a city ordinance. And uh, I think a neighbor called in or something. And a cop showed up to my vehicle, left a ticket on my, on my window while I was at work saying that I had to move my car within 72 hours or they were going to tow it. And, you know, it's one thing to feel homeless uh, in a car, and you, at least you've got a little bit of, of shelter when you sleep. You know, you got your roof over you, but, you know, the thought of losing that car was like, man, I'm really going to be homeless if I lose this car. And uh, so I just I, I was advised by uh, my friend's grandfather. He said, just move it uh, 36, or no, he said, move it three feet, and they can't do anything. And so I did, and it bought me some time, because the cop came back, and he saw that I had moved, and so all he did was give me another citation, because the neighbor had kept calling, saying that there was an abandoned vehicle there, which, my car didn't look abandoned. Uh, you know, it was a 1964 Chrysler 300K, it was a very nice car, uh, classic, um, I just think that they didn't want it parked, because they knew I was sleeping in it, in front of their house. I didn't really know anywhere else to go, you know? Um, so I stayed there as long as I could until it just became kind of a hassle to move my car, you know, every couple of days. <laughs> and uh, I think I went back over to my original neighborhood where I grew up as a kid. And there was this field uh, called the forest. And uh, there was a series of dirt jumps that me and my friends had built in one of my friend's grandpa's backyards. And uh, they didn't mind me staying back there. And what was cool about this was there was actually a local shop nearby, a repair shop that was right up my alley of what I grew up doing. And so I went over there and applied. Turned out they knew my grandparents. Um, so they took me in and I worked for them uh, for, well, I don't know, a few months, six months or so. Um, until my car was vandalized. <laughs> I was at work one day, and my buddy that lived uh, at the house next to the field called me and said, hey, uh, I got some bad news for you. And I was like, oh, boy. And so he told me, you know, that uh, some kids have been back there with hammers and whatnot and bashing out my windshield and my rear, win rear window and uh, all the gauges and everything in the car. I mean, this was a really nice car. Uh, but after they got done with it, it was just, Beyond recognition, definitely. Uh, now I'm really starting to feel homeless. Um, but fortunately enough, uh, my friend's grandfather felt really bad for me. And uh, he took me in. And so I stayed with him for a while, you know. And then uh, my friend was working at the time too, so, you know, and he knew I needed money. So there was certain jobs around the house that he didn't want to do, you know, chores. So he would pay me money to, to do them, and I would, you know, I just felt, uh, you know, like, thank you, you know, I was really thankful, you know, that he was helping me out, and then uh, a friend of mine, actually my best friend at the time, uh, he was living on the other side of town in La Sierra, uh, by the Tyler Mall, Actually, he was staying in a hotel with his grandma. You know, it's funny. I look back, and a lot of my friends grew up with their grandparents. Must have been the generation of our parents. They were all a bunch of mess-ups or something. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I started uh, hanging out with him again. And then, uh, eventually, I don't know what, what motivated me or convinced me or whatever to, to move in with them. Because they were staying in a hotel at the time. Um, it might have been his grandma, you know, was like, you need to come with us. And I did. And I lived with him all up until the time I went to jail for the first time. And, uh, that was a weird situation, actually. Uh, I had a friend of mine that bought a bike off me. And, uh, he was actually making payments to me. And he, uh, was trying to default the last payment. 
and I got upset. And the, I it got so angry that uh, I ended up hitting a napkin holder and it ricocheted and hit his manager in the eye and caused it to, you know, cut open and bleed all over the place. And a friend of mine that took me there, he was like, we got to get out of here. And so we did. Um, and actually, for about nine or ten months, nothing happened until um, I got pulled over on a traffic violation and found out that I had a warrant for my arrest. And so they took me in. I uh, found out that it was for assault with a deadly weapon, of all things. I was just like, oh my gosh. I didn't even know what it was for because, you know, so much, so much time had gone by. I actually thought it was something else that, you know, had happened with a, a family member. I thought he was, you know, because he was trying to steal my car. And uh, he was trying to claim that I ran him over, but I really didn't. Um, I don't know what his motive was to try and get me arrested at that age and all the stuff that I was going through. But, uh... Nonetheless, that's what I thought it was from, and it wasn't. It was from that napkin holder. Man, and I fought that thing in court for six months, and uh, they eventually ended up giving me, you know, a year in county. Um, I served about ten months out of that that year. Got out, got out of good behavior, but again, now I'm getting out. I've got nothing. You don't even get you don't get gate money or nothing when you get out of county. You got nothing but the clothes on your back. Um, this was roughly, let's see, it was December of 2001 that I went in and I got out in 2002. So I'm trying to remember exactly where I ended up because I know, I know who I finally ended up with. Uh, it was my friend that I stayed with in the hotel. And, uh, that family took me in again. And, uh, yeah, a lot of that time frame is blurry because, uh, I lived my wild, my life so wild after that, you know, uh, for at least about a year, year and a half, uh, until I met, uh, a girl. Uh, we ended up getting married, actually. It was crazy. I, I, I did a complete 360, turned my life around. Um... And we were, we were dating for about a year or so, maybe almost two years. And I asked her to marry me, you know, um, we found a good job. Uh, and then about a year or two in, uh, it was around 2004 ish. Uh, no, no, 2005, the beginning of 2005, we found out that she was pregnant and so I ended up proposing to her, and she said yes. Um, we ended up getting married uh, before my son was born. I had my first son in 2005, and that was like a life-changing, you know, moment in my life. I completely went you know, 360 from this dark situation that I was in. Um, and I'm trying to remember it because it was like. 2003 or 2004, right before we found out that uh, she was pregnant. I was actually dating her at the time. I was working for this plumbing company. We were working out in, like, Mary. No, it wasn't Mary. We were working in, uh, oh, my gosh, I forget what town it was. But we were at New Track Homes. I was uh, working for a plumbing company and uh, learning how to plumb for the first time. And I got a call from my aunt. And she told me she had some bad news. I should probably sit down. And my grandmother had passed away. Whew. Yeah, that hit me hard. I mean, I knew inevitably it was coming sooner or later. Um, but she finally, you know, passed. And I just, I lost it. Um... Moving forward to when my son was born, you know, that kind of helped me move on a little bit, you know, new life into my life. Uh, we got a new house. Um, that was a pretty wild time because I took on a financial responsibility that was really large. Um, but I mean, I was making good money at the time, so it, it felt like it was okay. 
Um, and this was prior to the housing crash in 2007. And um, I finally, I just felt all the pressure coming down on me. And uh, me and my wife ended up actually splitting up. And uh, I went and got an apartment on my own in San Bernardino. Oh, what a mistake that was. Um, ended up going back to prison for something I didn't even do. I just, oh, so many turn of events right there that was so blurry too because, you know, I was falling apart, doing a lot of drinking. And not so much the drugs at that point in my life, but a lot of drinking. So I think that's why a lot of it's blurry. Um, I started dating another girl. And, geez louise, man. Yeah, that didn't work out. Got out of prison after six months. So I served like a violation or whatever. And so on and off, I have been homeless since I was 17. Right around, like I said, uh, the 2000 era. And uh, it's been very difficult to deal with it so many times. But now, because I've been through it so many times, and sometimes are more extreme than others, I don't want to say it's getting easier. Um, I don't want to say I'm accepting it because I'm not. Um, if anything, it's more motivation, uh, especially with having two more children now that are both toddlers, two and four. Um, it, it pushes you. You know, and I'm at work right now talking to you guys. Uh, I finished my work early, and uh, so I was like, oh my gosh, it's Wednesday. I just realized, I was like, I need to post some content, you know, before I become un irrelevant. Not that I'm super relevant today, but... <laughs> You know, we're trying to get there, uh, bring awareness to homelessness and uh, trying to help end it, you know, because there is, I believe there is a way, I believe um, our states, our government, our country, the United States has really misappropriated a lot of funds that we have for homeless people. Uh, we definitely should have eradicated homelessness by now, um, especially with uh, these elections coming, the elections coming up, all these people vying for presidency, uh, Mike Bloomberg being one of them, geez, uh, thumbs down to you, guy. Uh, you know, you said you wanted to help people, you wanted to make change and all this stuff, and you spent close to a billion dollars, if not more than a billion dollars, in ad campaigns. Seriously, dude, a billion dollars? A billion dollars would have eradicated homelessness. Half a billion dollars would have eradicated homelessness. A, bi a billion dollars would have, like, <laughs> stamped it done homelessness you know sufficiency here we go this is self-sufficient you're no one's homeless anymore in the united states billion dollars gone down the drain anyways i won't go down that political path uh but yeah bloomberg <laughs> you know what you did and uh you're tucking tail and running now you fell out of the campaign so that's just a billion dollars wasted you really could have done some good with that money you could have created a lot of long-term self-sustainable homes for the homeless and needy people of America. But you failed us. As I knew you would. I never even considered you a front-runner. Um, I, I am actually a firm believer in Trump. Have been since uh, 2016. Uh, and not because... He was into social media and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, honestly, he's just a very successful businessman. And I believed that's what we needed to change uh, America and what we've been dealing with uh, with the past presidents. None of them have done anything. Okay, I, I don't care what they say. They haven't done anything because the rising number of homeless people uh, in major cities is just astronomical. And for there to still be homeless people in 2020 fighting addictions and yeah, the, the crazy thing is like the number one reason that there's homeless people is a lack of affordable housing uh, they keep building these big huge uh, luxury apartments and it's and townhomes and it's rising the rent on everything else you know because everyone's uh, gonna raise their rent to compete with prices surrounding them all it's doing is causing more homeless people. And the sad part is, and the sickening part is, is there's a lot of vacancies, a lot of vacant homes. Um, I'm actually surprised there's not more people squatting in homes because there's so many vacancies. Um, 
um, I've come real close to myself uh, to squatting at homes. You know, because I just, I've seen these houses that were empty for years. I'm like, why isn't nobody buying this house? But come to find out, the banks are controlling all the housing. They're controlling the market. They're controlling the prices. Um, and that's how they do it. They hold on to a house for a long time. Um, and then it looks like we have a, a shortage of housing when we really don't. So the prices go up, supply and demand. It's a crazy, vicious cycle. So yeah, but now fast forward to 2020, I'm 39, going to be 40 this year. Um, I'm changing directions. Um, and you know, recently I was questioned on why people should follow me, you know, like I'm just a homeless guy at 40 and I've always been broke. No, I haven't always been broke. Um, honestly, uh, there's been times when I made bad decisions, bad investments. Um, there's been times when I made good investments and didn't continue them, you know. Sometimes when you're young, you think money's never going to end, you know, especially when you're making good money. There was months where I was making $10,000 a month. <clears throat> it's terrible that I'm homeless now knowing that, you know, I'm looking at some of my paychecks even from last year and I'm like, oh my God, how did this happen? You know, but at any given moment, any of us can be homeless. I had a company I put a lot of faith into and I was working for them for damn near a year, making them a lot of money, and they were making me a lot of money, um, but I just was stupid, wasn't putting money away, you know, just thinking, this is never going to end, they love me, I love them, this is a great relationship, but uh, one day I got called in the office, and uh, it wasn't even the owner, it was uh, the management that hired me, and they're like, I'm sorry to tell you this, Dave, but uh, you know, the owner wants to go a different route, I'm like, what do you mean, dude, I'm bringing him in half a million dollars a month, uh, we went from nothing to half a million dollars a month and we're rising our next goal was a million dollars a month like you're serious right now <laughs> i created this you know and i remember one of the last conversations with my owner that i had was he was just putting me down and um you know saying you think you did this no i did this i'm like i was baffled by his uh attitude and ungratefulness because the department that I was running and managing was only producing twenty to sixty thousand dollars a month, if that. And I came in and doubled those numbers right away. Personally, sold a hundred thousand dollars and more. Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, on just a blink of an eye. Sorry, Dave. We're gonna go another option. Drop me on my butt. And granted, uh, you know, I was qualified to go to another company, which I did. Uh, but then that company turned around and um, did me dirty too, you know? I just don't understand it. So, you know, we uh, left Texas because that's where we were before we came to Illinois. Uh, things were getting hairy. I couldn't afford to live out there anymore, you know, with losing my high-paying jobs. And uh, a friend of ours told us, hey, there's a lot of affordable housing out here where we're at in Effingham. And when we got here, we come to find out there wasn't. There was actually a shortage of affordable housing here. I don't know why you would have told us that. I think maybe because they they found a house for five hundred dollars a month. It was a two bedroom, one bathroom, nice backyard. Um, you know, and they actually told us, you know, that uh, hey, we're gonna get a bigger place because they were expecting another kid. And uh, we said okay. Uh, they wanted to leave us the house that they were in. The landlord landlord was okay with it supposedly, um, but he never would let us meet the landlord uh, to talk to him about this plan, um, come down to it to the day that they had their child. Uh, it was on a Saturday morning. They uh, called us up and gave us 48 hours to move out. And that day it was snowing and raining. I was like, well, what? Dude, he's like, well, you knew this was coming. I'm like, yeah, but didn't think you were going to give us 48 hours, dude. So that's how we ended up homeless this time. So we took the took the word of a friend, and it's just to go to show you. Sometimes uh, you just need to rely on God, uh, rely on yourself, and no matter what happens, you have to stay working. That, that's the main thing is finding work. Even if I mean, like I had to take a huge pay cut coming out here because there's no jobs out here that make what I was making. So, and then, you know, I've added that. I got child support for my first marriage, uh, my first kid uh, that I still have to pay for. So, 
you know, even though I'm making 13 bucks and some change an hour right now in this factory, uh, once you take out child support and taxes, I'm, I'm left with like 275 a week. It's hard to survive on that. Uh, and now my wife, she's, uh, picked up work. Uh, she's barely about to get her first paycheck here soon. I think coming this Friday. So things are going to start looking a little better for us, but we are still staying at the hotel. Um, so we're not like suffering homeless on the streets that's that's a plus um, but we don't have our own home and that's what we're pushing for so hopefully that'll change here really soon and uh, even though if that happens we're I'm still continuing down this path of trying to help others because I it, it just relates to me too well and and I don't want to see other people have to go through this that's terrible especially in this area there's not very many resources for people uh, and that's really what it's about is, is trying to find the right resources for people uh, finding long-term sustainability, uh, building affordable housing communities. Uh, that's why when we went and took a look at this hotel, it's got to be perfect. And, and wouldn't you know it, like shortly after I posted the video, I was being contacted uh, about it, and they liked my ideas. And so uh, I've possibly got people interested in my ideas that uh, want to help me get it funded. And so we're uh, trying to iron out all the details to figure out how we can get it done. So that's a super positive update on the hotel situation on turning it into an affordable housing community. I really believe in that. I, I believe it's going to happen. Um, so if you're a praying person, please help pray with us that uh, we are able to get the finances for this. And, uh, you know, they're, they're wanting to do some kind of nonprofit, but I don't want to do nonprofit because uh, for the simple fact that when you go nonprofit uh, and you're asking for state funding and government funding, now you have to jump through their loopholes. You have to obey certain guidelines and regulations, and there's no long-term help with those kind of programs. I want to have this thing privately funded, and that's why I started this YouTube channel was to privately fund uh, this mission. And so uh, I appreciate everyone that's watched this video this far in. I don't know how long this video is going to be after I edit it. Probably around the 30-minute mark. So I, I really appreciate you guys for sticking around this long and listening to everything I got to say about how um, I became homeless for the first time and, and still struggling with it today, you know, on and off uh, throughout my life. Uh, but to stay positive for all of us, leave some comments below. Let me know if you've got any ideas. Um, yeah, anything that you guys can do to help is great. I'm not asking for money or anything like that. Uh, we're not trying to scam anybody. We're just uh, the best thing you can do to help is uh, while you're here, hit the subscribe button. You know, uh, that definitely helps the algorithms to put this video in front of more people. Uh, hit that like button. You know, so that way uh, the YouTube algorithm know that you are the type of person that likes this video. It's going to show more people like you this video. Um, yeah. That's the main thing is views on videos. That's that's how you get monetized, but you have to have at least a thousand subscribers. That's why I'm pushing for this subscriber thing right now is I've got to have at least a thousand subscribers to be able to monetize and start making money off the ads so that we can start, you know, pushing f towards private funding for these affordable housing uh, communities. And uh, I, I really believe in it. I'm going to continue to make these videos no matter what. Uh, that's why I was like today. I was like, oh, my gosh, I got to make one today because I'm really trying to stick to posting on Monday. Wednesday and Friday. If I fall behind a little bit, please don't hold it against me. Uh, it might get pushed back a day or something, but because uh, I am filming on a Wednesday night, uh, so I don't know if I'll get this before midnight. You'll probably be seeing this on Thursday uh, morning or afternoon. Either way, guys, thanks for joining me. Um, I super appreciate all the likes, all the love you guys give. Uh, I appreciate all the organizations that have helped us up to this point, the churches, the pastors. Um, big shout out to Pastor Tyrone Harvey, uh, Pastor Katie Orth. You guys are amazing. Thank you for being a part of this journey. And uh, we're going to sign out, guys. We'll catch you next time. God bless.